2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 4. But in all things, approving ourselves as ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses. Jesus handpicked his disciples. Every single one of them, even Judas, Jesus picked those disciples for the purpose that they will be instrumental in bringing the gospel to us, the generation that will be there after Jesus is gone. God planned to use those who are born again in Jesus Christ for the work and for the ministry of God, and therefore we call them ministers of God. The first question is, why human? Why use human? Can't God just do the work himself? Why does he have to use human? When you say, well, he's God, then the question is, why can't he use angels? They can do many things more than we can do. Why not use angels? Why use human? Why the human agency? Why is that important? Why not save us by just speak the word and we'll be saved? Why raise up the disciples? Why go through all the agony and pain? Why put them through all these things like you guys are thinking I'm putting you all through all this misery? Why do that? Why does God use human to bring the message of deliverance to humanity? Human sin. You see, the angels sin, and God had judgment for them. There is no deliverer for the angels that sin. When they sin, they immediately go into the place of condemnation. But human, we're different than the angels. So angels cannot save us because they sin. Some of them did. The human, on the contrary, we all sin. Every single one of us. And so humans sinned. And therefore, we got to save ourselves. Isaiah 59 verse 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and and your God. Your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Because of our sin, God is separated from us. He is not near us because we sin. When Adam sinned, he is thrown out. He is cast out of the presence of God. He does not hear us because of our sin. So how can God save us if he, does not, if he doesn't hear sinners? We have all sinned. Every single human being sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What does that mean? You are running. There's this gap between you and God. And you take your position and you run really hard. And then you leap, leap over that ditch. And then you just almost reach it. But then you don't come near it. So you fall down. That's what falling short means. That you don't reach it. You leap, but you don't make it over there. You fall short. You think that you can, and many fall into the abyss because they don't make it. They, they can't make it to the other side. The reason is because there's this rope that ties each one of us, and this rope is called sin. The rope is sin. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 22 his own iniquities shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sin. See, it doesn't matter how strong you are, and unfortunately, we're not that strong. But not only that, but we are tied with the cord of sin. You cannot reach God because sin has a hold on us. There's no way, there's no amount of work or energy or effort that you will be able to put in to reach God on your own because there's this cord that will tie you. Human have sin. We will pay making restitution, satisfaction. You step on someone's foot. How do you repay that? You allow them to step on your foot? Does that wash away your sin? 
their foot is still hurt. What if you accidentally kill someone? Or intentionally kill someone? How do you repay that? So from a human perspective, we see there's a limitation in what we can do. There is certain sin that when you commit, there's nothing you can do. Even in the, the words that we, we say, you say, I take it back, but can you really take it back? When you say something that hurts someone, can you take it back? Or do you say, well, why don't you say the same thing to me and then we'll be even? Yes, it, it can be even, but it does not take away the sin. When we transgress or when we sin against God, how do you repay? How do you make satisfaction? How do you make restitution so that God is at peace because now everything is back to the way it was? Nothing will be back to the way it was. When you sin against God, it is, it is an eternal transgression. And so the eternal punishment for the eternal transgression is fitting because it will take an eternity. Because we can never make restitution to God. We cannot satisfy His wrath because we sin against an eternal God. And, you know, and this is why angels cannot come and rescue us. Because also angels are created things. Angels cannot rescue us. God, on the other hand, does not sin. So God can't repay for our sin. He didn't owe himself anything. So we're doomed. We have no one to save us. Who's worthy to save us? Is there a class of human beings that are perfect? Can you think of anyone? Can you think of any race, anyone at all in our history that is worthy to take the place for us? In Romans chapter 3, verse 10, as it is written, there's none righteous. No, not one. But you say, what about Abraham? Abraham was righteous, right? He did. But the Bible says he was righteous. And how can that be? How about Lot? Was Lot righteous? How about Enoch? How about Elijah is taken up. Moses, well, all those guys. Are they righteous? Well, the person who is most righteous that the Bible talks about righteousness is, is Abraham. Abraham's righteousness was accounted to him because he believed in God, not because of the work that he do. He believed in God and therefore he was righteous. No one is righteous innately. No one by themselves or by their work is considered righteous. What about Lot? The Bible says, in all of Sodom, Lot was righteous. How is Lot righteous? In the same way that Abraham was righteous. Abraham prayed for Lot. Remember, God was going to destroy Sodom. And Abraham said, God, if there will be 50 people, would you not destroy 50 righteous people? And God said, yeah, if there are 50, you can find yourself 50 righteous people in Sodom. I will not destroy the city. And then he came back and said, how about 45? And then he went all the way down to, God, don't be angry with me. I couldn't find any about. How about just 10? And then God said, okay. And then he left. Couldn't find 10. Could not find one. And so he prayed and Lot was accounted righteous because Abraham prayed for Lot's family. That's how Lot is considered righteous. Not because he was innately. Remember when Abraham came, oh, the angels, sorry. The angels came. He didn't want to go. They laughed at the angels. No one is worthy. The Bible says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. No one righteous. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20. For there is not a just man upon the earth that does good and sins not. There is no one. 
There's no one who obey the law perfectly. What does it mean to be good and what does it mean to be just? It means that you obey the law completely. You did nothing wrong according to the law. There's no one ever lived that had not sinned nor committed transgression against the law. When you were, even before you were born, you sinned. David said, I was conceived in iniquity, meaning in sin in my mother's womb. No one is righteous according to the work of the law. No one was worthy until that baby that was born in a manger. That the angel came and said, God is with us. Romans chapter 8 verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. What that tells us is that no one. God looks at humanity and he saw no one could save them. And so he came down and took on flesh in the body of Jesus Christ. So that we, just like Abraham to Lot, through Jesus Christ, his righteousness will be imputed to us because we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in that baby. We believe in the Son of God. Christ must be made flesh because he has to be human to save us. That's why the incarnation of Jesus Christ is so important. Angels cannot save us. God does not save us. Jesus Christ has to put on flesh so that in his humanity, the Son of Man saves humanity. And that's how God saves us. I hope that's clear. There's no deliverer besides the Son of Man. That's why his name is called the Son of Man. He was flesh, 100% just like us. He was born, he has a mother. Though he does not have a father, the Holy Spirit conceived Mary. He was 100% man. He was the son of man who took on flesh and for sin, condemned sin in his flesh that we might inherit his righteousness for those who believe in him. What does a minister or servant look like? Let's look at two passages. But I have good news for you. They're exactly the same. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, and in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And I believe why this is important that both of these books mention the same, the, the same words that Jesus says is because this word is so important. Where well, every word that Jesus said is important, but this one is particularly important because it tells us why he came. And for what purpose? The Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom of many. Servant. A minister serves. Jesus did not come to have people serve him. He came to be a servant of all and to make his life a ransom for others. That's a minister. A minister is not someone who sits in a good chair and have people minister to but a minister, a servant, is someone who rolls up his sleeve, puts a towel around his waist, and he went and washes his disciples' feet. That's a minister. That's a servant. Matthew chapter 20, verse 26. Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Let him be your servant. The quality of a minister is one who serves willingly, who wants to stoop down and say, just sit there, I will serve you. That's what we saw in Jesus Christ, someone who serves. And he serves his whole life for us. There's not a time where he kicked up his leg and said, okay, I'm done, it's time for you guys to serve me. There's not a time in his life that he did that. He served his whole life until he went to the cross. And even there, he did not stop. Our master washes the disciples' feet. We ought to do the same. Do we serve each other? If we are servants of Jesus Christ, if we say that we are minister of Jesus Christ, do we find opportunity to serve? 
The greatest among these will be the servants, but the least of these. Jesus says, if you've done this, if you give a cup of water to the very least of these, you've done it unto me. Jesus came not to be ministered to, but he came to serve us. That's my Lord. That's my God. And if I be any resemblance to my God, I will serve. The character of a minister is a servant. Selfless, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake, yet for your sakes, he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. He doesn't think of himself. He disregards himself for others. We're living in a very narcissistic society today. Look at me. Look at my life. Look at what I have. Look at my beautiful portrait. Just look at it from this angle. Look at it from this angle. We become so self-obsessed with our look, with how we portray ourselves. Even the mask that we wear, we, we convey some kind of identity. I walk around uh, Santana Row and I see all kinds of stuff. It's entertaining. But in the end, it's people expressing their individuality. There's nothing wrong with that. But as servants, you don't care too much about yourself. As servants, you care about others. And Jesus disregards himself. That the foxes have their holes. The birds have their nests. But the Son of Man have no place to lay his head. And he said, it's okay. That's not why I came. He said, he doesn't need all that. Though he needs to pay tax. He told Peter, go, take a pole with you, go out there, pick up a fish. In there, there's money. Then you can pay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and pay to God what belongs to God. His life was simple. His life was not ornate like what we want our lives to be. He did not seek to have comfort, security. He lived to serve us. That's how his life was. He was selfless. A minister disregards his own life for the sake of others. Those things that might be gained to him, he counts it loss for Christ. One of the men in the Bible that the Apostle Paul spent a lot of time talking about is Epaphroditus. You heard about him. In the last verse in Philippians 2, and this is what he says. For the sake of Christ, he did not regard his own life to supply your lack of service for me. A servant, a minister of God is selfless. You see the rare quality in the people who serve the Lord. Look at the history of the servant of God. You will see glimpses of this rarefied quality in the lives of those who disregard their own comfort, convenience, and their lives to serve others. And Epaphroditus was one of them. Ministers who are willing to keep their promises even to their own hurt. Son of Man did not come so that he can be in luxury and comfort. He came to set us free. He came to set us free from those things. You, did you know that by pursuing these things that you seek for comfort, you no longer live? You are bound to these things that you are seeking after. So if you seek after God, he sets you free. And then you look around and you say, you know what, this life, God, got nothing for me. That's nothing for me. Sacrifice. <clears throat> Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God commanded his love for, toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
A minister of God lays down his life for his enemies, not just for his friends, for his enemies. While we're yet sinners, we're enemies of God. And you see, our mind is enmity against God because it's not subject to the law of God. And we cannot, indeed cannot be subject to God. So we become enemies against God and Christ came to die for his enemies. A minister of God lays down his life in obedience to the Father. Not my will, Jesus says, but yours be done. Not what I want. If I let myself, there are many things I want. There are many things I can have. There are many things. I'm sure some of you are young and you have your dreams. You know, adults have dreams too. I have dreams too. If I let myself. But we don't, we don't come here to live our lives. We come here as ministers of God, so we obey. We obey what God asks us to do. It's not easy, but it's freedom. You're not bound to the things that your flesh and your mind bound you to. Christ gave his life as a ransom for his enemy, for the enemies of God. And this is what he said in John chapter 15, verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lays down his life for his friend. Oh, I, I, wish, I wish that's how we end our lives. I, I, I wish that's how I would end my life. Three. What does the minister of God do, the work of God's ministers Sinners are not convinced by your eloquence. They are not changed by the sentiments, but they are moved toward Jesus by your unconditional love. You don't have to repay me. You don't have to give me anything. I do it because that's what God wants me to do. That's the attitude of a minister. I'm asking nothing in return. You don't, you don't have to bother yourself with thinking about repaying a minister of God. They're not looking to be recompensed for the things that they do. And one day, I will walk out of here and that's it. No string attached. Don't have to throw a party. Don't have to do anything. A minister accepts that the work that they do is in service and in obedience to God. And that's it. That's it. Ministers of God seek not to be known, but to be transparent so that Christ might be seen. So if you look at a minister of God, and that's all you see, the gifts, the creativeness, the beauty, the handsomeness, you're not seeing Christ. A minister of God is transparent so that when you look at them, you will see Jesus Christ manifest in their lives. They're not there to trump up their ability or their talents. The minister of God is transparent so that other people will see Jesus Christ. The minister of God must be approved. Let's go back to our text today in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 4. But in all things, approving ourselves as ministers of God. Are you a minister of God? Will you be a minister of God? The question is, how do you know? What are the qualifications and what are the tests? When you want to, to be a doctor, you are put through a battery of experiences and tests. And then after you finish, if you survive and you're still alive, then hopefully you have your white coat ceremony. A minister of God has to be approved. Awana stands for approved workmen are not ashamed. Approved of God, the things that we do, how are you living your life? What are the things that you're pursuing? Examine yourself to see if you are approved. Ministers must go through the crucible of God's refinement process. Don't be afraid of fire. If you're real. If you're precious gem, gold, or silver. But if you wood, hay, or stubble then be very afraid because there's nothing left after you go through the fire. But if you are precious metal, 
Fire is a refinement process. And though you might look like this, you know, you might be very large after you go through the fire and a lot of the impurities is burned out of you. Maybe you're like just a little bit. But at least that's real. That's pure. A minister of God must go through and the, the things that are used to be in my mind, used to be in my life, that I thought, hey, these things are not that bad. And when you go through, when I go through the crucible of God, I look and I say, wait a minute. Those things are still in my life. I'm still running after these things. They reveal the character, whether or not it is of God or it's not of God. The minister must go through the crucible. And then you see what happens on the other side. Now, if there's nothing on the other side, God can work. But God cannot work if you're holding on to things that you think are real but are not. So go through the fire and see what's left. Put yourself in a situation when you have to endure a fight and see if you can win the flesh. Fast for a day. Can you fast for a day? Two days? You see, you see the limit. See the extent. And then do that fast every week. And then you do two fasts a day to see what is, what is your life really made of. When you say that this is what I believe, do you put your life in alignment with what you believe? You know, the the early Christians, they fast two days a week. You know, at church today, fasting is not... It, it's, God doesn't need your fast. You need your fast. You need to discipline the body. And it's not just, just about practicing the, the resilience of your flesh, but it is about putting this flesh under the authority and the control of yourself so that God can use you. Put yourself through the fire. And when you want to reach out and do something, when you want to engage in something, hold yourself back and say, do I, can I say no to these urges, to the lust? When you want to sit there and play for another hour, can you say, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that? Can you stay up late and meditate on the Word? Can you... Involve yourself or, or invest yourself into the study and the memorization. I think memorization is one of the biggest challenges because it takes so much of your energy. If you, you want to burn energy, memorize the Bible. I guarantee you. It will quickly burn the energy because your brain uses so much energy. Memorize the Bible. And, and plus, um, eat less. Every instrument that God uses must pass God's refining fire. Just like a sword. Have you seen the master swordsmen, the Japanese craftsmen that, that make the katana? Have you seen the process? Some of them take years refining because that weapon, that instrument, needs to be perfect. And God's instruments are perfect because humans' souls are so valuable. To God. If we are going to be ministers of God, we need to be those instruments. God must make us. You know, if you do a study of all the people that God used in history, average 15 years of refinement. 15 years of refinement. They go through times of isolation. They go through times of loneliness, sometimes self-imposed, sometimes God-imposed. But they go through a duration of time when God refines his instrument. Every instrument of God must pass God's refinement process. Esther, Queen Esther, before she came and met the king, Remember how many months we were kept away in the purification process? 
after a year of purification, then she can come and meet King Xerxes. The disciples must go through God's cleansing fire before presented in the service of Christ the King. The apostles, all the things that we, they went through, most of them made it, but one didn't. The refinement process was too much for one of them. It was, actually, it was too much for all of them. Peter failed, didn't pass. But Jesus says, it's okay, I'll pray for you. Jesus prays for us. It's not our strength. Luke chapter 14, verse 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Discipleship is a privilege. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ is a privilege. It is a, a place of high esteem in God's kingdom. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ is a privilege. Many came and said, I want to go after you. And then they said, but first, let me. And he said, no. You're not worthy to be my disciple. Because to be a disciple of Jesus Christ is a privileged position. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all he hath, He's not begging us, putting us through the test. Examine your life. And he said, you cannot be my disciples. Joshua, look at the people. And he said, will you follow the Lord? And people said, yes, we will follow the Lord. And he said, no, you won't. You will forsake him. I know you. God has to give us the strength God has to give us his spirit. Why? Why does he have to refine us? Why can't he just use us the way we are? Why does God have to mold and make us into the refined instruments that he used? For what purpose? I'm glad you asked. Proverbs chapter 12 verse 11. And this is the reason. The tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. The tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. That's the reason. The reason is people are vicious. People are nasty. People are cruel. People are mean, they are selfish, and they hate anything that's not them. That's who we are, sinners. We don't like when other people are better than us. We don't like when other people look better than us. We don't like it when other people have things that we don't have. And so we have these social platforms where people present the best in themselves. Look happy. Smile. Okay, now you can go back and curse and yell at me. We step on each other to get to where we want to go because there's no way we can get to the top because the person who's at the top has stepped on other people to get there. So you want to get there in this life. You got to step on other people. The tender mercies of the wicked are quarrel. To face such an audience, ministers of God must be Resilient and tough. God needs to make you into this instrument in which when you come to people and they spit at you, when they curse you, when they turn their back at you, when they mock and railed at you, you still be okay. I remember the first time I went to San Francisco, well, as a Christian, in front of Union Square Mall, the mall has a lot of people, of course. In front of Union Square, there's little shops around. There's a place where you go down the BART station. We were down there. So people can see us from above, and then people from the BART station can uh, get to us. So we were standing down there, and we were worshiping. I was a young Christian, and I thought, hey, this would be great to go out there. 
And as we were playing, they were listening, and we stopped, and someone stopped preaching, and then we hear noises. Tissue paper thrown at us, and then larger and larger things get thrown at us. Wait a minute. Don't, don't they want to receive mercy and salvation? Why are they, why are they treating us like this? Some, some of them even spit on us, but thank God, you know, it just, they, they don't have enough projectile ability, so the spit didn't get to us. But it was pretty gross. And we, I, I remember as a young Christian, I looked like, wow. And I look at um, the people in front of me, and they were unmoved. They're smiling, and they're looking at the people, and they say, God loves you. They start preaching. They're unmoved by the situation, by the circumstances. God needs to build up a people who is resilient and tough so that they can speak to the people who are mean and cruel because those are the people who need to be saved. This is what God told the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 3, verse 7 and 9. He said, But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, talking about his commission to the prophet Ezekiel. For they would not hearken unto me, for all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads, as an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. God needs ministers who are not moved because someone makes them afraid. So God needs to shape us, God needs to train us, and God needs to make us resilient. Are you resilient? Are our kids being resilient? Oh, we are feeding them this soft stuff so that their teeth are not strong enough that they are not strong enough to stand on their own in the future? Are we coddling our next generation so much that they don't know what hardship is? So when the pandemic hit, everyone was like, wait a minute, what do I do now? I heard this morning that in Vietnam, uh, there are three degrees of separation when you get COVID, F0, F1, and F2. If you are F0, it means that you are infected. The person who is in contact with you is F1. And the person who is in contact with the F1 is called F2. If you are an F0, this is what happens. They knock on your door, and they come, and they just take you. Whatever clothes that you have on your body, that's what you will leave with. Uh, the church says that some people tell the church to bring food to them because they have nothing to eat. 21 days. Like that. In the time that they are quarantined, they're supposed to recount the past five or ten days and everyone that they met and encountered in the last five or ten days. Those are the F1. They get a knock on the door. The same thing happens to them. Imagine yourself in that situation. It's very different than here in the States, isn't it? Very different. We're not even built for that. Imagine that that happened. We're totally unprepared. Our kids are unprepared. We are unprepared. We don't know what to do. Imagine if you have no toilet paper. Whoa, that can happen. Imagine you have no food. We're unprepared. As ministers of God, we need to be prepared. We need to know when to be hungry and when to be full. In all things, I have instructed, the Apostle Paul said, to be abased and to be abound. We have and to have nothing. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. God sends his ministers to those who need to hear the gospel. And because they're mean and they're cruel, 
the meanest and the cruelest ones, unfortunately, are the closest ones to you. To say the incredible, heartbreaking things to you. But we are God's emissaries sent to deliver a message. It's not our message. It's a message that they need to hear. And we need to be built so that we can stand and deliver that message. That we will not run away because we're so afraid and we can't deliver the message because we are not trained and equipped to be able to do that. God prepares a generation crafted and honed in his shadow. Christ was not afraid. Jesus was not afraid. Peter was afraid until he was trained up. And then he says, should we listen to you or should we listen to God? And then they beat him and they threw him in prison. It's okay. They're ministers of God. They can deal with it. I wonder if I would be able to withstand if that happens. I pray to God that his strength would be made perfect in my weakness. People are dying in their sins. And they're unwilling to turn and repent. Will God have ministers, servants, who are willing to go to them and face them and talk to them and convince them and be able to stand in the face of rejection and scorn and mockery? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. It is God. God gives us the mercy that we will be able to endure. We be able to endure all things because of the Spirit of Jesus Christ that's in us. It is not our strength. It is not how intellectual we are, how powerful we are, or the amount of money that we have that we can buy persuasion. God says it's not by might nor power. By the Spirit. We need God's Spirit. But in all things, approving ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown yet well known, as dying, and behold, we live, and chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Father, we thank you for your calling and your gifting. I pray, Lord, would you raise up a generation that is exactly the words of your disciple, your servant that have gone before us. Would you raise up a generation that is not so involved in their own interests, but that they would be ministers of God, who would lay down their desires, and their lusts, and the things that they hold on to in this life, and that the power of Jesus Christ might be manifest in their body, whether it be by life or whether it be by death, Lord, that let the power of Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit be shown so vividly and clearly in the lives of those who call themselves servants of the Most High, that at this time, Lord, Separate unto yourself a people who are not fearful of the unknowns, but that they have been instructed in whatever state they find themselves in, they're with to be content. That they learn the way of the Master, that they walk in the way of Jesus Christ, and that they will be the beacon of light in this crooked and perverse nation among whom they will shine as light of the world, holding forth your word 
but that we will not run in vain, not to labor in vain. But I pray that we will be the living sacrifices lay upon the altar for the sake of those who would come to know you. And that in the day to come, Lord, make us resilient, make us strong, make us become the instrument in which God will use to deliver the message of the gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ in this time that the world would need to know and to come to the knowledge of the truth and of salvation. We thank you. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.